Welcome everyone, uh, those of you who are here in the room and also those who are joining us online. Uh, this is the latest uh, guest speaker program of the US Asian Law Institute at NYU School of Law. And I'm Catherine Wilhelm, the executive director. Our topic, law as infrastructure, China in the world, uh, is a complicated one. It's gonna take a lot of unpacking. Uh, our speaker is Matthew Erie, who's a professor uh, at, of law at Oxford. Matthew has been studying China as a lawyer and an anthropologist for many years, and his emphasis has long been on the flow of ideas across borders into China and out of China. Since 2019, he's been leading an ambitious project called China Law and Development, which has investigated the role of law in China's expanding global activities. Uh, it's been, China has been a builder, a project financier, a manufacturer, a trader. And one of the core questions that uh, this project is asking is, does China push its normative values, its priorities, or its actual laws and legal institutions out to the countries where it operates? In, uh, simple terms, we sometimes hear the question posed, is China a rule taker, a rule maker, or a rule breaker? Um, so the project uh, China Law and Development is now wrapping up. I invited Matthew today to share with us his main uh, findings from the project. You can find some of the publications on the website, which is cld.web.ox.ac.uk. Uh, I've also put some links on our event announcement page to two of Matthew's most um, most uh, major, most significant journal articles that have come out of the project. Uh, so he will now give us an overview, and then after that, we'll move to questions. Uh, those of you who are online, please use the usual question, uh, question uh, application in Zoom rather than the chat. Thank you very much, Catherine. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here, to be back at NYU. I um, taught here briefly uh, 2015, I want to say, um, and came back as a Hauser Global Fellow in 2018. And I've just really enjoyed every time I come back here and I learned so much from this community. So, so thank you again for having me. Uh, so it's really a delight to be able to talk about uh, the China Law and Development Project that I've been fortunate to lead for the past six years now, actually. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of the project and the goals and, and some of the findings as, as well. So the uh, China Law and Development Project uh, was really a, a rare opportunity to um, be able to carve out you know, a good chunk of time to do research on one topic. Uh, and this is a rare thing in academia, but I was very blessed to receive the, this grant and to devote the, the amount of time that I was able to do uh, to focus on this, on this one question. And just by way of background, so I, I wrote my my dissertation on the practice of Sharia in, in Northwest China. And over the course of my fieldwork, I, I learned that many of the Chinese Muslims were going uh, overseas to Malaysia, to Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia. And I got really interested in this question of sort of this outflow and the migration and what was driving it uh, in terms of, you know, was it religion, was it commerce, was, was law one dimension of it? And this sort of all fed my interest in understanding some of these broader dynamics of uh, of what China and, and some what some call global China is, is doing today, particularly in terms of its normative footprint. Um, the project really was born out of this, you know, the heyday of Chinese globalization um, back circa you know 2013 when the Belt and Road Initiative was announced. Uh, 2016 was the peak in, in Chinese FDI outflows. Uh, and there was a buzzy excitement in academia about what China was possibly able to do, right? That this was China's moment, its ascent, and there was a lot of, of, of interest. Um, and in particular, uh, the legal scholars as well. You know, 2018 was when uh, the Supreme People's Court set up the China International Commercial Courts uh, in, in Xi'an and Shenzhen. And there was just a tremendous amount of interest and, and optimism. In, in what was uh, going on. And, and people believe that there was something paradigmatic that was happening, something, something new and, and something quite uh, exciting. So it took about two years to plan the application for this grant, uh, submitted in 2018, received it in, in 2019. 
Um, and the original research design was really focused on, on, on building empirical data in terms of what Chinese actors were doing outside of China in engaging with challenging legal and regulatory orders, primarily in uh, low-income and middle-income countries uh, and, and, and their interactions with these legal systems, but also their interactions with international law through the process. So kind of two analytical levels. One was the international level and the other was the uh, domestic law of host states that were receiving Chinese capital. Uh, and the legal domains, the legal questions that we're asking were quite broad. We're interested not just in international private law or uh, international commercial law, but rather uh, including issues of labor, environment, public procurement, tax, dispute resolution, all, all the above. There were a number of kind of research questions that were driving the, uh, the, the project. The first is how is Chinese capital and law affecting jurisdictions outside of the PRC, either intentionally or unintentionally? Um, a second one being how are Chinese actors, and by that I mean everything from state-owned enterprises to private companies, tech companies, lawyers, officials, arbitrators, business people, how are they adapting to these challenging regulatory orders? Uh, and in return, how are these jurisdictions uh, and uh, how are they responding? How are they being changed as a result of these interactions? Um, and then lastly, what does all of this mean for the study of of law in economic development, particularly in now globalized context? So, so that's just the overview of the of the research questions. We had uh, developed a multi-tiered uh, uh, research uh, design. Uh, including a tier of, of postdocs. Initially, we had four postdocs who were doing develop, uh, various case studies and nine what we call development specialists who are mid-career scholars. Uh, and we had a number of themes that we're exploring along the lines of those research questions that I asked, including themes of institutions, practices, and networks. Uh, and so the postdocs were looking at questions, for example, of Chinese investment in agri uh, agribusiness in Tajikistan, the role of lawyers in servicing Chinese companies in Ethiopia, Chinese global supply chains and manufacturing centers in Vietnam, uh, and the role of dispute resolution in, in CPEC, or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Um, so that was the main idea. Then two things happened. One, COVID struck, and two, the US-China trade war. And the combination of these sort of the in, uh, endogenous shock of COVID and the exogenous shock of the US-China trade war greatly changed uh, the object of the study. So first of all, the object of the study, studying these Chinese, uh, the outflows of, of Chinese capital uh, were greatly abbreviated. Uh, they were uh, decreased as a result of these dynamics. And secondly, our ability to study them was greatly decreased. We couldn't travel. The entire research project was predicated on long-term immersive field work. So our postdocs were to be going out to the field for a year, interacting with various types of, of parties, interlocutors, and then doing the ethnographic write-up of the, of the results and then generating comparative analysis based on what they found. So all of this was basically shelved, but we couldn't stop the project for various reasons. The, the, the had been activated, the grant had been activated. So what we did was we built in this additional tier of the research design. And so what we did was we reached out to junior scholars, researchers, lawyers, uh, NGO activists, uh, even some officials who are from these countries that receive Chinese capital. Uh, and we developed conversations with them about what they were learning and we, we invited them to contribute data to the, to the project. Um, and so it's a process of adaptation. Everybody in this room had to adapt to COVID uh, as, as did we. Um, so having said that, I want to quickly kind of touch upon some of the goals of, of the project. So the first is really focus on empirical data. There's a lot of talk in DC and these other places about what China is doing, what global China is doing. We wanted to go to these places and find out what was happening. Okay, so build that empirical data in terms of what's actually happening on the ground analyze it and generate outputs for different types of audiences, for legal audiences, for social scientists, for policy people, and, and, and for governments. And, and we've been doing all of that. Um, as a related thing, we wanted to um, uh, build an ethnographic record of what was happening, okay? So when we think about the study of empire, 
We have anthropologists that have gone out and they've looked at these dynamics in local settings. Max Gluckman in Northern Rhodesia, he was called back then. Um, in the study of the, uh, the U.S. empire, Paul Kramer's done work on the Philippines, uh, Sam Ehrman on Puerto Rico, Sal uh on Hawaii. But we don't really have a good ethnographic account in terms of global China. All right, so it was this, this was one of the goals of the project. We also wanted to build partnerships with people in these countries. We wanted to learn from them, but we also, if possible, wanted to contribute some of our own knowledge because many of these communities actually have a paucity of knowledge about China. They have their own histories of engagement, but oftentimes it's mediated through certain government agencies or bodies. And so we wanted to contribute to local knowledge production um, on the ground. Um, so those are all some of the, 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 the goals of, of, of the project. Um, just very briefly to talk a bit more about the conceptual framework. Um, I think the first thing you have to do is ask, what is China in all this? When we talk about China, what is that exactly? And as I said, China is many different things, right? The SOEs are not doing the same thing as the private companies are not doing the same thing as the small, medium-sized enterprises, not doing the same thing as, as Chinese lawyers. So we have to separate them out and we have to ascertain what they're doing and, and, and then do a comparison based on what we see. Um, we also have to be uh, attentive to this issue of the gap between discourse and praxis. That is, oftentimes the government is making claims about what it's doing, but the actual behavior that's observable empirically on the ground is quite different. And we want to be attentive to that, right? So don't just read speeches by Xi Jinping, as great as they are, but actually go out to these destinations and engage with people uh, in terms of understanding what is happening on the ground. We also wanted to look at the response in terms of the local country, uh, get into a bit of the history of the bilateral relationship, understand local agency of actors there, and it also touches upon issues of political economy. And then for this audience, we're obviously very interested in the question of the role of law in all of this. So is China engaging in legal transplants? Is there regulatory competition that's happening? And how can we most efficiently deploy international comparative law and social sciences to understand these different um, aspects. So uh, in the course of the research, uh, at least for, for what I did as principal investigator, I collected about 550 interviews, uh, con uh, conducted many months of field work in multiple countries, including Pakistan, Cambodia, Singapore, and elsewhere, and collected primary source material, including um, hundreds of court cases in these various jurisdictions. Um, and then my the, the postdocs and the development specialists also collected their own set of data, and this is used for, for analysis. So let me just briefly touch on um, some of the, so that's the, the data, some of the, the findings. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through all these. I'm just going to highlight a, a couple. Uh, the first thing is there's a, there's a saying in Chinese that pigu uh, jading nao dai, which I'm going to translate very politely as um, uh, where you sit is how you see the world. And uh, there was a real intentional effort here to get outside the U.S. and to uh, go to the countries, to learn from people there, to understand how they were experiencing global China on their own terms. Um, and also uh, through extensive conversations with um, research team members in China. Uh, so I intentionally, you know, went to Singapore for a year and, and, and lived there to try to understand what was happening from the Singapore uh, context, because it's so different. The, the China conversation is so different from it is from the way it is here and also the other countries that I that I mentioned. Um, one sort of major finding of the project is that the, in terms of the changes that are observable, the effects that that we could see there's no uniform approach to what could be called transnational legal ordering, to use Greg Schaefer's term uh, and Terry Halliday's term, but rather a much more patchwork or piecemeal ad hoc approach to trying to um, uh, create environments for tra uh, contractual and transactional certainty in these challenging uh, uh, countries and jurisdictions. Um, it was also quite opportunistic at times in terms of uh, how projects were designed and how uh, Chinese companies were able to do the business that they could do. And there were clearly supply side dynamics and demand side dynamics that were not always on the same page. 
And, and one sort of idea that has come out of the research is that what's happening in the Chinese case is not necessarily what happened in the case of the expansion of the US historically, or before that, the expansion of the UK historically, where you know, we have ideas of law as empire and the role of law in imperial formations. That's not what's happening in the Chinese case. It's not a forceful imposition. Uh, and already we have this um, layer of Anglo-American law that exists uh, through international um, transactions and oftentimes adopted into the frameworks of these uh, former colonies. Um, and so it's not you know, a blank slate by any measure. And because of this, there was a much more subtle approach to the integration of, of sometimes Chinese law, sometimes not Chinese law or foreign law, into these uh, projects in terms of the contractual arrangements and the frameworks that they deployed. So this invites something that we call legal infrastructure or law as infrastructure. So I wanna spend a moment talking about this. This is a, a kind of conceptual contribution of the paper. And legal infrastructure is not about legal imposition or kind of unilateral uh, 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 law that's, in, that's forced upon uh, a population, but rather uh, assemblages or uh, uh, ensembles or bundlings of different types of law, including Chinese law, but it could be UK law, law of England and Wales, could be Singaporean law, that these are integrated into the course of the, the project and how it um, operates. So there's different types of layers and they kind of interdigitate. Uh, and it's also conducted through various communities that China has been uh, building, uh, including communities outside of China. Sometimes it is built upon pre-existing layers of law, the projects that we see, but other times there are new areas where new infrastructures are built out as well. And I can talk about those maybe uh, in a little bit. Uh, but I, I, I take this idea, it's, it's, legal infrastructure is not my idea. It comes from uh, Katarina Pistor, uh, the comparativist who's written about this in her great book, um, The Code of Capital. Uh, uh, Gillian Hadfield uh, has written about this, the great scholar of law and technology. And Benedict Kingsbury here has written about this in his uh, fantastic Infrareg project. And I was kind of involved uh, with that project through Thomas Strenz, who was previously here. We co-wrote on the question of uh, data governance. So it draws on comparative law and international law and science technology studies to move away the idea of pure legal families to look at how they're integrated and, and how they're combined in the course of uh, cross-border work. So I can say much more about that. I can say much more about these various findings but probably at this point, uh, it may be helpful for me to kind of give you a concrete example of, of what we're talking about. So this here is a map that was shown by uh, Leo Genia in 2014 at the SIGRA conference in Paris. This is the Council on Large Electric Systems. This is a major standard setting body and thousands, I think 3,000 or 6,000 people were in attendance. Leo Jinya is a fascinating figure, uh, the former chairman of State Grid, one of the largest SOEs in China, electricity provider. And uh, subsequent to this, Mr. Leo founded uh, GAIDCO. GAIDCO stands for the Global Energy Interconnection Development Cooperation Organization, bit of a mouthful. GAIDCO is a kind of atypical standard setting body. And this map here is a kind of blueprint that was shown again in 2014 that gives the vision of GuideCo. And this is a world interconnected through uh, ultra high voltage and smart grid technology. And you can see China is very much central to this, right? Because China has really mastered this technology and China is bringing it to the world. In particular, Latin America is a major region where we see a lot of these projects. Uh, the research team has been conducting interviews with experts, engineers, lawyers uh, in Latin America. And this image keeps on coming up in the conversations, that people, that this made a deep impression on people who were in attendance at that meeting in 2014. It was a captivating, captivating vision, excuse me, of global interconnectivity. Now, GAIDCO nominally was established to promote standards, technical standards for these emerging industries, so clean energy, uh, et cetera. Uh, yet to date, it has been largely a failure. This has not happened. And one of the reasons for that is that these countries have very different regulatory regimes for dealing with these questions. All right, they have very different standards, different laws, different regulations, and there's lots of gaps between them. 
gaps that have proven very challenging to, uh, to circumvent. However, at the same time, GuideGo has worked with already established standard setting organizations to promote its standards. And that's one approach for integrating Chinese standards into international frameworks through the existing bodies. So for example, the IEEC, uh, or the, sorry, the IEEE and the IEC, these are some of the established uh, standard setting bodies. Um, in doing research on these questions in Latin America, however, we've gained insights that uh, Chinese actors, state grid, and local affiliates have been working within existing regulatory regimes to promote Chinese standards. So you have this attempt to, to integrate into international bodies, and that's well documented, but also sort of bilaterally within, say, in the Brazilian market to try to introduce Chinese standards. Now, there have been many failures, but there's been a few successes. There's also some evidence to suggest that parties are Chinese parties are nudging regulation in a country like Brazil to uh, to favor Chinese standards. And that helps in terms of market access and market share, uh, but also creating stronger ties, to the local economy. Uh, these are all ways that there are clear benefits to to Chinese parties. However, I will certainly underscore that research on this topic is incredibly difficult. It's absolutely challenging to get clear evidence in terms of this sort of effort to promote Chinese standards into a specific body, say, in Brazil. However, having said this and recognizing that there have been some limited examples, this is, an, this is uh, one instance of a kind of infrastructural uh, uh, project, right, where legal infrastructures at the cellular level, that is standards, are used to promote commercial transactions, uh, industrial policy, and economic development. And this allows Chinese companies then to effectively predominate. They can use these standards in their contracts uh, and possibly even help promote the use of Chinese law, which is gaining more and more traction extraterritorially. So all of this may have positive spiller effects for Chinese firms, not just in this sector, for example, in the, um, the smart grids, but in adjacent technology, adjacent industries as well, for example, uh, electric vehicles. However, it all depends on the operation of the regime, the regulatory regime in the host state. That is the critical factor. And so we've been collecting data that demonstrates the uh, very important role that the local regime plays in either permitting this sort of um, transfusion or, or transfer of, of standards or blocking it and preference for local versions. So that's just one example of a kind of legal infrastructural approach um, I'm going to pause there and allow Catherine to uh, allow us to engage in a bit of conversation. Thank you very much. That was um, a great overview, and you put a lot out on the table for us to dig into. Um, I wanted to start by picking up on your statement that China, you didn't you didn't find evidence of an of an effort to impose a uniform approach to transnational legal ordering. So so the way I understand that is that Chinese companies and Chinese embassy, say, in the host country or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of Commerce are not rolling out a set of directives, not saying in our company's um, infrastructure work overseas, you should follow these laws, you should impose this, this should be the law of choice for dispute resolution or that kind of thing, right? So, but but you also are not saying that they are, that Chinese actors are sort of passively accepting the situation they find on the ground. It's something in between, right? Yeah. Um, would you say that they are behaving differently from other actors? Are they just a bigger presence and there, there aren't that many other actors and therefore we pay attention to them. Is there anything about the, the uh, Chinese companies' uh, uh, behavior in country or the embassy's behavior in country that is different from what say a French multinational or British multinational might be doing? Yeah, sure. So I, I so first there's two aspects to that. Uh, and one is how do we understand what different types of Chinese actors are doing? And I think it's fair to say that amongst the SOEs, there's clearly a, a greater nexus between their operations and the government. And so there you see clear lines of communication, you see some uh, degree of, of um, you know, instrumentalization of what the SOEs are doing in, in foreign markets. 
Uh, but it's also not a clear, it's not necessarily a, a, a simple uh, uh, unilateral uh, communication. Oftentimes, SOEs have quite a bit of, of, of agency, if I can use that term, in determining the scope of the work and, and business operations. So it's not simply receiving directives from upon high. There's, there's, it's more complicated than that. Um, it's that, that relationship between the company and the, the Chinese governmental agency is much uh, less clear in the case of private companies. They're uh, you know, what we see is, for example, in the event of a dispute, oftentimes the Chinese company, you know, if it's operating in an African country, will go to the embassy to try to seek coverage, and hopefully that the embassy is going to intervene and mediate that dispute, oftentimes with reference to the corresponding African uh, governmental agency, right? The SOEs will have some success in doing that. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, going to be successful every time. When the private companies try to do that, it doesn't. Work. It usually is 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 very difficult for them to affect that same kind of mediation. They just don't have the same kind of relationship with the government um, in terms of its ability to represent the interests of the private company. So there's again these different types of relationships that that play out. Um, I think one of the, the the big things that differentiates, yeah, so market share is a big thing in some of these uh, countries. You know, Chinese companies clearly have uh, a majority share, and particularly in these emerging uh, uh, industries and technologies, there as well. So that's that's one distinguishing factor. Um, but also, in addition to that, uh, you know, oftentimes a distinguishing factor is that Chinese companies in many of these countries are are newly arrived. And so oftentimes you see them making a lot of mistakes, uh, particularly in terms of violating local law. It's not necessarily intentional, but it's a reflection of their inexperience versus you know, a French company that's been operating there for 20 plus years, they're gonna have a different set of, of behaviors that they demonstrate in that jurisdiction. But this then all opens up what we call the learning curve. So Chinese companies are learning through this process. They're learning how to acquire local knowledge, sometimes uh, through local counsel. So there's a really interesting set of relationships between Chinese companies and the local lawyers that they hire. Um, you know what we found in our research is there's actually quite a degree of dis of um, a lack of trust actually that defines that that relationship. Um, in many contexts, lawyers in China that are servicing certain types of companies, they are fixers. They are uh, enmeshed in certain types of relationships, uh, official and otherwise. Lawyers in Pakistan, Ethiopia, whatnot, they may be enmeshed in their own different types of relationships, but they don't mimic exactly what the Chinese are used to, the, the representatives of the company back, back in China. Uh, for that reason, there's uh, degrees of lack of familiarity and distrust brews as a result of that. We've even seen cases where Chinese companies have hired lawyers, uh, a second team of lawyers, a second law firm to check on the work of the first law firm that they hired because they they have that little trust with that first law firm, right? So, um, but but that's a really important link because the local lawyers are basically training up the Chinese company in terms of how to do work in that jurisdiction, right? Uh, so so the the experience issue is is another factor, uh, and then I would say the third factor that distinguishes is the uh, PRC legal regime for governance over outbound investment. Uh, so I've done research with the great Zhang Jingjing. Uh, on this question, and what we found is that the the Chinese legal regime for regulating, for example, uh, corporate social responsibility or the social and economic effects of inbound investment, so FDI into China, that regime is much more sophisticated, much more complicated uh, and cutting edge than the reverse, than the regime that governs outbound uh, Chinese capital flows. And part of the reason there is the ministry, I think it's called MEE, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, which is actually supposed to have jurisdiction over these issues in, in terms of environmental concerns that arise in the course of China's outbound investment. It actually um, only has jurisdiction over domestic matters. It, it is not allowed to regulate um, cross-border transactions. And so as a result of that, you have a lot of soft law. You had a, a lot of voluntary agreements or pacts, if you will. Uh, but you don't have really hard law that's governing the Chinese outbound investment flows on these questions of social and economic impact in local communities. And that's different. You know, if you look at what other country, uh, companies from other countries, uh, you know, France, Germany, U.S., there's just going to be a different legal regime that is um, that's governing those outbound capital flows. China's not there yet. Will they eventually? Probably, but not yet. So that's another sort of um, example of this learning curve. That's interesting. The, there had been, you, you probably are aware of this, there was this period of time in the few years right after the BRI got rolled out, where a lot of Chinese NGOs that worked on the environmental protection, worked on worker rights and so on, 
had a hope that they could advocate for better behavior by the Chinese companies offshore yep. in environments where it would be safer for them to engage in advocacy and then get those companies to learn better behavior offshore and bring it back home to headquarters. That Clearly, we haven't seen that happening, but that was yeah. a sort of, yeah. we're going to export good behavior and That's then weird. re-import it. Yeah. But there wasn't really any path for that to happen. No, I, and part of it too is there's a lack of institutionalization on on this stuff. And one thing that's really uh, just flummoxed me is um, there's not a lot of sharing of information within sectors. Um, so companies aren't sharing information about doing business uh, in certain jurisdictions. But there are efforts now to um, to create more knowledge about you know how the legal systems work, how they operate, how to do business in these countries. And, and and that's becoming a bit more centralized. And so there's more guidelines on that. Um, but that's that's another factor, which is sort of this knowledge sharing that it's strangely sort of siloed. The other, the other strand though that you talked about was that China is strategizing to bring about, to have an impact to, to change the way things are done around the world through standard setting bodies. And also, you didn't talk about it, but others have documented their efforts at the UN in treaty negotiations and that kind of thing, or through uh, UN General Assembly resolutions. So those, I think, are the two pathways to influencing law, hard law, or, yeah. and some, so I guess, standard softer law around the world that have been sort of pegged as a Chinese uh, focus, yeah. special focus or specialization. So could you talk a bit more, more about what you see there um, and, and why has China been so successful in those venues yeah. compared to other countries? Yeah, so I mean, I, I mentioned the example of the standards because I think that's really something where China has uh, gained some success. If you look at the, uh, the standard set of bodies in terms of the amount of uh, standards that the Chinese representatives have successfully put forward and uh, and gotten through that there's there's quite a few. So that seems to be a clear example of a, of a positive uh, instance in this regard. And I think that's important, particularly given, you know, the direction we're moving in in terms of embracing all sorts of advanced technologies, AI included, uh, that's going to be a huge growth area down the line. So that's something to, to watch. Um, has China been successful in UN bodies? I mean, it depends on kind of who you talk to. Uh, so one thing that we have looked at is, is human rights and China, the UN Human Rights Council. And I mean, it's kind of mixed, right? So China has been putting forward this idea of development as a, as a human right, which has a, that whole concept as a certain provenance in post-colonial Africa, 1960s. China has its own version of that, um, which is sort of oddly wedded to this pre-existing notion. Uh, and they have gotten into a couple of these resolutions. But, um, but so far, I think some of these intentional designs, like they oddly sort of misfire. Uh, I think at some point a couple of years ago, there were real attempts to create these, they had five regional workshops where they're going to be sort of proposing and promoting this idea of development as a human right. And, and one was Latin America, one was in Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but they really didn't really gain traction at all. Uh, the, it wasn't successful by any measure. So there may be like this idea to popularize an idea to integrate, you know, a Chinese definition of a certain legal concept into international law, but the implementation is not always there. Um, and there are clear examples where where also we see that happening. So I, again, I'd say we have sort of a mixed track record in terms of success of trying to promote in a more centralized way, sort of a Chinese version of some aspect of, of international law. Um, but again, it's, it's actually pretty, you know, relatively early days in terms of thinking about the the grand sweep of things. And I think, um, you know, it depends upon a number of factors, including building more support in these countries. Uh, we have more countries that are, you know, signing on to China's definition of, of human rights and, and Xinjiang in these places. So, you know, there, there's also some evidence to suggest that in the future, there could be more and broader support uh, as well. What do you think are the implications of your research project for the U.S. government policy towards China, other governments that are concerned about BRI and their policies towards BRI in China? Right. Well, so I think um, in terms of implications for, for developing countries, what we see, first of all, is there is optionality now. Um, it seems to me like uh, despite the misfires and the unsuccesses uh, that 
the Chinese are not giving up um, and they keep coming back for more and uh, and they adapt uh, and they're changing and modifying their message and communication through the process. Um, and there is now this idea that there's competition with US aid, uh, including sort of law and development aid. Um, and so I think that's something that both development countries as sort of the host or uh, audience uh, countries that they're picking up, but also to some extent, the, the US. Um, some would say there's attraction in the autocratic toolkit. And so thinking about certain aspects of surveillance uh, that China is providing, uh, others would say the US companies are providing the same amount of the surveillance to uh, various countries in Africa and Latin America as well. So it's not distinct to the, to the Chinese. Um, but there's also questions of what I'd say administrative erosion in some of these um, host countries, like in Bolivia, where Chinese companies are very active in the lithium industry, there's a public procurement system uh, so again, this is one of the examples where China has an outsized presence in a certain industry. Uh, so there is this formal system for public procurement, but Chinese companies seem to find ways to circumvent that in all sorts of creative uh, uh, maneuvers. There was a 2016 case, the Zapata case, which uh, gained a lot of traction in the media. And that was a case where Gabriela Zapata, uh, who was a board member of this uh, Chinese affiliate, and also the ex-partner of the then president, uh, basically was, was getting contracts for like 560 million US dollars through corrupt means. Um, and and so uh, there's been ongoing, beyond that, ongoing examples where Chinese parties have been finding exceptions uh, within or loopholes within this public procurement regime. Uh, and I think that's problematic when thinking about these nascent legal systems, right? What's the long-term impact if you have a major player that keeps on uh, violating the law or circumventing the law? That's not a good thing for legal development in in, in these countries. Um, another thing I would say is what we call the cone of silence towards China, uh, about China, or rather a certain type of talking about China that is officially uh, permissible. Uh, so in a lot of recipient countries, the discourse on China is, is far from critical. And I think this is very intentional. Uh, and, and so there's not just you know, self-censorship, but there's in some cases explicit censorship from, from local regimes that are implementing sort of this message about what China is or what it should be doing or, or what it may be doing. Um, and, and so this is another dimension of, of, of sort of implications for, for the research. Um, I think you know, the, the US right now is sort of stuck on certain memes of uh, data trap and debt trap uh, I'm not sure those are particularly productive as uh, pressure points on this. I think there could be a much uh, finer grain analysis and hopefully you know the research could be helpful in that regard and shed some light in terms of the actual effects. you know the sort of there's a design, there's a for a project or maybe there's a policy, but then there's the actual sort of implementation and the reality on the ground and we were drawing attention to the latter. Um, and I think you know the the, the US, um, government that is so concerned about China needs to calibrate uh, uh, what it's doing in terms of having a, a more uh, empirically informed approach to uh, potentially um, uh, compete with, with what China is providing in terms of public goods to these countries. Because right now, as I was saying, the, the discourse is pretty broad, it's pretty vague, and, and actually, I don't think it's factually accurate. The, uh, the debt trap narrative has been really debunked by a, a number of, uh, of scholars. So uh, again, I think you know. Uh, hopefully, the project can can bring sort of a fine grain analysis in terms of what is actually happening. So I want to take start taking questions in just a minute, but uh, so get your questions ready. But my 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 last question would be: Would be you mentioned um, an example of corruption? I mean, given the amount of money that has been going out from China, it would be unsurprising if there were no corruption uh, found. Has did you did your project make us take a special look at corruption? Uh, has that is actually one negative uh, result that I haven't read that much about. A little bit, you know, the occasional report about uh, Chinese building a road to a, a a national leader's hometown or something of those, but but yeah. not a great deal. That hasn't been a yeah. big theme. Yeah, so I think this is this is uh, very much a real problem, um, and uh, it's 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 clear uh, in the course of our research we've come across this a, a number of times, and it's to some extent reflected in some of the the case law that we've collected from host states, uh, and it demonstrates some of the problems that Chinese companies have have uh, have have uh, incurred there. Uh, to some extent, the Chinese authorities are aware of this. 
for many years, China has had its own version of the FCPA uh, in the uh, the PRC criminal law. I think it's Article 164, but don't quote me on that. And uh, this was pushed by the U.S. government, in fact, uh, circa 2011, to kind of level the playing field. Um, to my knowledge, almost no PRC court has has uh, cited this provision, except for uh, uh, very recently, where uh, there have been uh, one or two cases where actually this has been uh, used as the basis to uh, prosecute uh, Chinese uh, parties that are conducting business overseas. So we may be at the cusp of something that suggests there's going to be more enforcement uh, of anti-corruption outside of China. China has a massive anti-corruption movement campaign internally, domestically, but the question is exactly whether or not this is going to, and I mean, so far the evidence is just, just the opposite. Um, it hasn't really had those extraterritorial effects to date, and I could say more about this in, in uh, Cambodia in particular, uh, but, uh, but as, as I was saying, I think we're just starting to see more offic official attention to this, in part because the realization that there's a lot of capital flight. There's a lot of money that's being lost uh, through corruption. So let me start bringing in some audience questions. Um, one person online asked, could you say more about what you have learned about contracts with China, Chinese law as the governing law? Yeah, so one interesting finding is uh, Chinese companies are not necessarily incentivized to use Chinese law. I mean, it is familiar to them, right? So there's that. Uh, but oftentimes what we see is, again, as an example, sort of this path dependency in the code of capital, there's use of uh, uh, English law, Singaporean law, um, uh, other other foreign law, um, because uh, the Chinese companies may be uh, comfortable, as comfortable with that as they are with uh, Chinese law. It really depends upon the particular Chinese company that we're talking about, right? So if it's a major SOE that's been doing outbound investment for 20 years, you see a certain ecumenical approach to this the question of choice of law in their contracts. Um, if it's a smaller company that's going out for the first time, uh, you might see a more a greater likelihood of, of Chinese law uh, being used in, in that contract. Uh, so it really it depends massively. So it's very hard to give a simple generalization on this point. And then similar on this point of dispute resolution, because people oftentimes focus on the dispute resolution clause of the contract, um, there it's, it's very mixed as well. Uh, First and foremost, Chinese companies prefer settlement. Absolutely. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, and if they can avoid litigation, they will. Particularly if that litigation involves interacting with some you know, post-colonial, uh, bureaucratic, foreign language court that they just don't understand at all. And that's where the local lawyer comes in. And there's all sorts of fascinating dynamics as the company has to lean on, depend on the local lawyer. And yeah, it's just very interesting from an ethnographic standpoint. Uh, so avoiding courts uh, is, is huge. So arbitration can be used uh, if economically feasible, but not every Chinese company is going to use it because it's now it's so costly, right? The judicialization of arbitration, they call it. Uh, and so, yeah, some mediation, um, um, but, but also, you know, this question of trying to bring uh, uh, either uh, disputes back to China or then acquiring local knowledge in host states to actually uh, be proactive about litigation. And now we start seeing companies using local courts in like Pakistan to sue Pakistani partners. So that's an interesting flip. And that demonstrates, as I said before, one of our big themes is this learning curve. That's it's quite interesting. Um, yeah. is, is the Chinese preference for mediation or for some kind of conciliation or solution outside of a court, yeah. something that's faster and cheaper, is yeah. that preference in those specific settings any different from what other actors are doing? Because these may be settings in which nobody wants to go to the local court yeah, or yeah. everybody wants to avoid expensive litigation or arbitration in Paris. Yeah, um, that's that's a fair comment. Um, and I think, you know, these behaviors are not unique to China. I think it's oftentimes a matter of a difference of degree and that kind. Uh, and a lot of interlocutors, uh, people that we talk to in these countries will say, yes, you know, the French, the Germans, the Americans also avoid our courts, but the Chinese in particular. And that's kind of a refrain that we hear over and over again. So there seems to be a particular, you know, set of behaviors that are demonstrated uh, in terms of local local courts. Please debate, as you probably know, about whether the bilateral or um, actually affect how to found investments. Do you see patterns with uh, Chinese public flow to 
depending on whether there is a treaty in place to protect investment, whether it's a regional one or bilateral. Yeah, so the Chinese are champions of bilateral investment treaties. As you know, they have more BITs than any other country except Germany. Uh, and some of the data suggests that, yes, um, once a BIT is in place, it depends upon, there's like three generations of Chinese bits, right, in the literature. I'm not exactly sure if that's accurate, but uh, that 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 is there's a positive correlation uh, that the outbound uh, FDI does follow once a BIT is in place. Um, I don't know that that's a uniform observation, but there's clear evidence to suggest that. Um, and so that seems to be one thing that's been, pardon me, successfully deployed. Multilateral is, as you know, a little bit, it's less common, um, but there to some extent uh, in some of these regional um, economic partnership agreements in the, in the FTAs, there might be uh, 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 an investment chapter in there. And uh, that also would uh, suggest that, um, you know, there's a preference for that. I think, you know, China has certainly benefited from from RCEP without being the prime mover or driver of the uh, of RCEP. Um, and so I think that's one level of analysis is looking at sort of that IEL international economic law level and, and the Chinese are very keen to uh, to support treaty uh, formation uh, which is helpful to their outbound projects for sure. Question. That came from an answer you gave in the last session, because I think somebody asked whether China has peaked, and um, I think the answer you provided, maybe from a different source, was that you think China has peaked. But here you have a lot of empirical evidence and about its building its influence legally, and Catherine was mentioning how China is successful in UN lawmaking. So, do you want to provide a little bit more empirical evidence with regard to whether the question whether China peaked or not? Well, it may be factually accurate that you know China is slowing down. Uh, and again, as 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 I think I mentioned uh, in the previous session, there's difference uh, of views in terms of whether or not that slowing down signals a plateau or a decline. Uh, it may be too early to to say at this point, uh, but. Um, but it, it is clear that you know China today is not the China of, of 10 years ago. However, having said that, not everybody uh, is aware of that fact. Uh, and so the perception of China as this you know, super economic power uh, is, is very uh, relevant in a lot of countries. Uh, China is perceived to be essentially a, 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 a very uh, wealthy country a country that is going to provide um, investment that's much needed. It's going to provide roads and stadiums and all these public goods and infrastructures that uh, that are much needed. Um, and so the what I'm saying is that the uh, demand is still there. The demand hasn't decreased, even if China has slowed down. So we'll see if the demand decreases uh, as as the as the slowdown continues. But we're not quite there. Uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much. And just wondered, could you talk about, you mentioned like the attractions of the sort of Chinese legal regime abroad. And so could you talk a little bit more about the sort of features of attractiveness of the so-called uh, BRI jurisprudence and also the Beijing effect you've written about. So when it comes to like data governance, investment, dispute settlement, uh, IP protection, anti-corruption, like from, from the local actors perspectives, what are what makes the Chinese legal regime or a particular type of jurisprudence abroad attractive relative to the conventional or status quo or the Western led ones? So yeah. yeah, this is a good question. So there's a lot of different things that are attracted to different types of actors. So again, hard to give a general answer to this. It depends on the particular country, the context, the relationship with China, et cetera, right? So I think number one, China's providing good stuff for cheap. Okay. And that's attractive to anybody, right? So the infrastructure is, is for the most part good. There's lots of examples that what English media brings up about fallen bridges and these sort of things. But for the most part, it, it's, it's well constructed, it's constructed extremely quickly and the Chinese outbid uh, and outperform other competitors for that reason. So the, the, the material infrastructure is really what, what drives it, but the, the legal, the normative, uh, the regulatory infrastructure, it sort of tail, it follows from that, right? So that, you know, the example of that I gave with the Geico and the uh, standards in the smart grid context is, is one, is one instance of that where, um, you know, it's sort of infrastructure first, 
governance second. And that's another thing that we've thought about in the project, right? It, it's kind of the reverse of the American approach, right? The American approach um, would be something like, let's lay down a system, a regulatory system first, and then we would, you know, input our commercial activities within that system. That hasn't been the Chinese experience to date, but it's been changing, right? So again, I'm talking about adaptation and, and this process of change uh, and, and the Chinese parties have lost so much money frankly, that now they realize that it is important to have a solid contract in place. It is important to designate your place of dispute resolution, right? And and so lawyers are playing a more active role and there's gonna be business for years, uh, I think, for, for lawyers in these in these contexts. Um, another dimension of what's attractive, and, and here we get into the political stuff, is uh, you know the Chinese are not attaching conditionalities the way that Americans do or other international um, uh, funding agencies. And that's hugely attractive to autocratic leaders who frankly don't want to deal with that and just want money, right? Um, now, do Chinese have any um, conditionalities? They probably do have conditionalities, but not in the sense of, you know, the uh, the Western banking sense. Um, you know, there's probably a certain clipper of quo that follows from the, uh, the the Chinese financing that flows into these countries. But I think it's, it's very clear that, uh, as I said before, now there's optionality that uh, certain leaders and rulers can you know, look to the Chinese as a source. Um, but also the whole banking financial structure is changing as, as well as, as it becomes more relevant um, on, on these projects. Um, and also dealing with the domestic uh, economic um, situation within China. So I think you know, those, those reasons are, 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 are first, uh, you know, the public goods infrastructure is, is good, it's cheap. Um, two, that the um, the law kind of can follow from from these projects, and 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 uh, uh, third, that uh, autocratic leaders will look to it before its uh, lack of conditionalities, and therefore it's quite attractive uh, for those individuals. So we got a, a question submitted online that I think dovetails with this one, uh, asking to your understanding, uh, what factors mediate recipients' willingness to adopt Chinese legal or regulatory norms, I guess, to the extent that they are adopting Chinese legal and regulatory norms, why would they do that? Yeah, so there's a few examples that we found of Chinese legal transplants, and they're oftentimes in the data uh, governance space, cybersecurity um, uh, in particular is one, and, and there are countries like Uzbekistan, Vietnam, uh, and um, and elsewhere that have uh, that have a certain predis predisposition, I would say there's a, a political affiliation, there's a pre-existing relationship there, a one of trust, uh, and and also um, seeing China as providing uh, law legal resources in important and emerging uh, areas that are of concern to that uh, host state. So in particular, cyber and data, which is is so critical. Uh, you know, controlling data flows for autocratic leaders thing. Uh, and China has now, you know, developed in some cases the most sophisticated uh, system of laws around these issues in the world. Um, and so countries will look to that. And we've tracked examples of uh, officials from these countries going to China, doing training, and then going back to their respective country. And then soon thereafter, you see a piece of legislation appears that looks very much similar to what China has done. Um, there's been some limited constitutional borrowing in Cambodia. There's some evidence that um, certain provisions from the PRC Constitution, particularly uh, uh, provisions that prohibit certain types of protests uh, against the state, have been borrowed uh, by Phnom Penh. Uh, and also in countries like in Uganda, there's examples of borrowing Chinese approaches to centralization. So constitutionally provided structures that talk about centralization versus decentralization. Uh, that that um, Uganda has looked at China as a model and example. So again, it depends. I hate to say it's 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 all dependent upon these local contexts and situations, but that's really it. So it's the history, the relationship, uh, obviously the political system uh, in the host state, and then the willingness to uh, look to China as you know uh, offering these legal goods that uh, may be um, as good, if not better, than what Western uh, uh, rivals or competitors are offering. So we just have a few minutes. I'm only going to take a few more. So um, go ahead, sir. Look, uh, my background uh, is kind of nearly 20 years working in Southeast Asia in project development country finance. Many of our clients of the regional law provider were Chinese SOBs and Chinese lenders. 
one thing, that area, I'm wondering if one question is just the same in the other areas, Africa, South America, they don't have experience. In. Many of these projects, hydroelectric project, railways, have worked out. They had absolutely no economic sense at the project level. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese, uh, between the Chinese construction, steel supply, cement, whole crews of like almost 100% Chinese workers going through the countries, uh, they got all their money up, out up front, like, sort of all funded by Chinese lenders to the Sino Shores and yeah. the Guarantor, and commercial deals. So it was sort of like the SOEs, and, and we're all taking the money out up front from the construction company with the Chinese lenders possibly holding the bag in the projects which. Uh, our projects with no off takers, uh, with no demand for power, railways, like white elephant railways, like they're trying to allow railway. Yeah. Uh, this, with the standard approach in the model, they're trying to get all the money up front and then yeah. projects may or may not work. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that. So that's sort of exporting the entire Chinese ecosystem outside of China, right? You talked about the right. SOE, the contractors, the uh, the lenders, China Shore, political risk insurance, the whole King Kabuto come going out together. I mean, that's sort of the ideal, but it's not always, including Chinese laborers, right? But that's, it doesn't, it's not always workable in every in every context, right? There's going to be local requirements to use local labor, or there's going to be something that's going to split up or otherwise, you know, ensure that that ecosystem isn't exported in mass. Uh, but I have seen examples of that elsewhere, uh, particularly like countries like Pakistan. What you said was, you know, it makes no economic sense. I think that's fascinating. And that may be a point that also is a point of difference. Um, a lot of these projects just lose phenomenal amounts of money. It's just staggered. Um, a lot of these countries, uh, again, because I spent time in Pakistan, um, there's been instances where, you know, not only is there economic loss, but there's loss of life. Uh, you know, there's active uh, terrorist uh, attacks uh, just very recently against Chinese workers in Pakistan. And yet the Chinese don't leave. I find that astounding. There's a real commitment. And you could say it's the, uh, you know, in the China-Pakistan economic order language, it's the, we're brothers made of steel or iron, or, you know, our relationship is higher than the highest mountain. There's all this sort of flowery uh, discourse and sweeter than the sweetest honey. Uh, there's all this language about this. Um, there's something going on there. And, and that's where you might suggest there's a geostrategic reason why these Chinese SOEs are so active, right? So, you know, there's, there's corridors that go through uh, Pakistan, and there's Xinjiang, of course, which is an area of interest. And I imagine in Southeast Asia, there's probably similar uh, corridors that are important for China to secure. And so it doesn't matter if there's if there's loss of money. I think in Africa, I think in Latin America, it's probably it's farther out. I think there's less of that going on. Uh, so it's hard to make that geostrategic argument universally. But I think it's another fascinating sort of you know example as there's maybe some points of difference with other. Um, providers of these projects. So clearly we could ask many questions because the size of this project, the scope, the ambition of it is so large. Um, there are many different uh, lines we could drill down on. Let me just to wrap up uh, a final question. Where are we going to be able to read the big picture report on this? Is, I understand there's going to be a volume coming out. And, and then um, are there lessons you learn from taking on such a huge, ambitious, complicated project that you can share, mm. maybe just one or two. Yeah. So we have four books, one uh, case, case book and uh, a special issue coming out. So uh, we will flood your inboxes with all that good propaganda. Don't worry. Uh, so yeah, the good stuff is yet to come. I'd say the number one lesson that I learned on this project is make sure you work with good people. And, uh, you know, it's the people that are around you that, that matter. It's the people that you're interacting with every day. And they have to have your back. You have to have your theirs. And if you have that, then you can do anything. I don't care if you're working in the toughest country in the world or there's every obstacle possible in front of you. If together, you'll find a way. Uh, and I really believe in the power of teamwork. So I'll end on that positive note. That's very inspiring. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you all for coming.